if I told you that the central mechanism of Kinfire was deck building, how many cards would you say draw on your turn? I bet you thought five, or maybe six, not seven. But it is seven, which probably made you think, wow, that's a lot of cards to play on your turn, a lot of things to do, except you only get to play one. So what, did I just draw a bunch of pointless cards for choice? No, because you don't discard them at the end of your turn. You also get to play cards on other players' turns. At every step, Kinfire does something different and meaningful to play on your expectations. Just take a look at Kinfire's box. Well, hey, the lid comes off. How quirky. Except. It's not just a lid, it's your board, like what you play on. Right under that, the first thing you see when you open Kinfire is the welcome box. That's where you find some central cards and tokens, and also a rule book that tells you how to proceed. Underneath that, there's individual boxes for each of the six playable characters with character art, a bit of backstory, and one of their abilities, so you can get a sense for what it's like to play them. There's also boxes for the game's 21 scenarios, and together they form a picture, plus some other stuff that's still a mystery. Nice, all of this feels nice, lavish, but it also subverts expectations of what happens when you open a board game box. I just wanted to illustrate the thought and care that went into how you first encounter Kinfire, because that thought and care permeates through parts of this design. But at what cost, you might ask me, and, well, you know, it's in the title. 149 smoochies to your wallet. Don't you just love it when board games are so expensive, you have to morally justify it to yourself to buy it. You could buy, like, a Nintendo Switch Lite for that money, a stand mixer, a budget weekend camping trip, five other board games. I mean, if, if you're middle class, you can afford this. But this game is gonna have to do work to be guilt-free. So let's take a look at what's so special about Kinfire Chronicles Knights Fall and ruminate on what this trend of $150 board games becoming a standard means. Family Combustion Register Bedtime's Descent is a role-playing adjacent campaign. Each scenario, you have a story vignette and then a combat encounter. I specifically want to show you the mechanisms for combat because that's where most of the innovation happens. You already know that this is a deck building game where you draw a hand of seven cards and can only play one of them, which is not untrue but it isn't the whole picture. Half of your deck are action cards. These are things that can affect your enemy with damage and statuses. For example, shot to the knee and you're to blame is not a card that's particularly good at dealing damage, but it does place trapped conditions onto the enemy and it focuses its attention on me and its range. So when I'm fighting this dragon, it's great because A, I can make it upset and make it want to get to me and B, prevent it from getting to me. Whereas Adam and Blazing Crown, apart from being a name I used to dance under, pulls all enemies from adjacent spaces to yours, deals them two damage, and then gives you an armor for each enemy targeted. Fun on its own, but pair it with an aura that damages each enemy that moves when they're near you, and you've got a recipe for combo fun. Also a name I used to dance under. These probably sound like exciting but standard fantasy dungeon crawler type abilities, but they're inserted into a system that wants you to think not just about how you will take your turn, but when you will take your turn. Or more specifically, the probability of when you'll take your turn. This is the chit bag. In it are some chits with numbers, hearts, your character portraits, and this ominous thing that is totally fine, I promise. Each turn you'll draw one, and that's whose turn it is. Sounds simple, but let me tell you, this bag is a yikes generator. Here I wrote in the script some sort of dubstep aggressive yikes montage, but I've ran out of time. So just imagine this music and me like putting my hand in the bag and going, Whoa! Let's say I draw this chip, number five. That means it's the enemy's turn. Yikes, what will it do? The ability that is on number five. That is the painful one, double yikes. Okay, I just took eight damage and that's more than half of my health, but it's fine, it's fine. Whose turn is it next? Basically, if the enemy attacks me again with any of these chits or any of these chits, 
I will die and that is an instant loss and since about half of the chips in this bag activate the enemy it's not looking good for our heroes. You have some leeway here. If you've done well in the story portion, you'll get doled out some fate tokens. Spend one and you can literally manipulate fate by pulling four chips from the bag and choosing which of them activates. But not only is it gone, you also have to put the spend token into the void box, not to be opened until presumably some pivotal point in the campaign. There's also cards that let you futz with the Yikes bag, but mostly it's just brutal luck, which strangely works really well. Think about it, there's just not much you can do to manipulate this bag, so you always have to play, like every turn could be your last. You have to push, optimize, squeeze every ounce of milk from the one and only card you get to play. It's a really milky game. When I wrote that, I was like, Oh yeah, milk sounds tough, right? Cause it's milk. I don't think I know what I'm doing here. Comment if you like milk. But what about the variants? Isn't this just too random? Well, if you're asking that question, you're kind of missing the point. Sure, there's 29 shits in this bag, the variance is high, but you're probably gonna go through most of them, if not all, and things tend to sort of level out. In one scenario, we had a fight that felt pretty easy because we just kept drawing chits with our faces on it. We kept hitting the enemy, things were going great, and then we got cocky and later realized that it's mostly just the enemy chits left in the bag. Yikes. And so we come to the other half of your deck, the boost cards. Unlike action cards, you cannot play these on your turn. Instead, they are things you can do on your friends' turns or enemies' turns or sometimes even in between. Boost cards are essentially assists, providing extra defense, damage, movement, or even card draws. They feel small and inconsequential, but in the context of this system that constantly asks you to maximize your turn, I found myself asking my friends if they had cards that could help me and also offering boosts to support them on their turn. Kinfire wants you to play like a tight-knit group that encourages and supports each other. Remember that card combo that pulled all enemies towards me and gave me armor and damaged every enemy I moved? Well, right here, I would only be able to pull two enemies, but if someone boosted my movement, I could literally get all four. And that doesn't feel so inconsequential anymore. One last thing I find very nifty about the system, I mentioned that you don't draw cards back at the end of your turn. You instead only redraw once you spent your last action card, which again feels minor, but has a huge list of consequences. First of all, you discard whatever boosts you had left, which is big because Maybe you wanted to hold on to these for when it's not your turn. You also get to flip your lantern card, which is a very powerful ability unique to each character. You also discard any conditions you're holding in your hand, which could be great if you're holding a grip of fire ouch, and less great if you're holding stinky man. What's wrong with getting rid of stinky man? I mean like PU, get that card out of here, am I right? Well, actually, whilst this is a negative condition, it specifically penalizes you for when you discard it like that, but not when a boost helps you discard it or any other method. So it's getting very complicated already. It could also be bad if your hand is filled with armor cards and their cumulative protective abilities. Discarding your hand could be great and or awful, which is all the more interesting that the game gives you tools to manage that. Boost cards with draw abilities give your friends choice whether they want to draw or discard. And again, that's something you enabled on their turn, opening up a richness of tactical possibilities. That's true on paper and most of the time in practice. Playing Kinfire feels breezy and tactical without the rules bloat that normally hangs on a game like this. It lets you play nifty characters like archers that defend from a distance or bards that power up everyone's cards with added effects with the entire rules for combat fitting into this tiny booklet. I'd say this is designer Kevin Wilson's He of Descent 2nd Edition and Arkham Horror 2nd Edition best game to date and a real achievement. The rules are simple, dare I say, elegant, and every single one of them exists for a reason that ties the design into a holistic experience. It's real good. And if that was the entire story, I'd say, listen, 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 listen. I know it's expensive. 
it's a luxury, an indulgence, but you know, indulge yourself. You won't regret it. You'll have a fun time with your mates and then it's technically resettable, so you know, pass it on afterwards. <sighs> well, talking of stories, there's nothing about Kinfire's setting that's particularly bad. I even call it imaginative. I know, big words for a board game. But there's also a distinct sense of incompleteness. I mentioned that on the back of your character folio, there's a blurb of a background. I love board games that give me more than the standard cookie cutter archetype. That blurb got me excited that I'm gonna play someone with an actual personality, backstory, something that sets it apart from the flood of fantasy guff. Right? Well, I don't know. You tell me where to draw the line. Technically, all the things I mentioned just now are here in the game but just at the bare minimal amount. Through the course of these scenarios, I did learn more about Valora Helmsman, my upper-class archer defender, and she does have one or two notes more to her character than upper-class archer defender. But I didn't learn anything that made me relate to her or trick me into suspending my disbelief that she's anything more than a composition of cards and a health dial, which is more than most board games, but when I compare it to equally expensive games like Descent 3rd Edition or Artisans of Splendent Vale, which both have their own issues, Valra doesn't hold a candle to characters like Harinia or Varix, whose personality I fondly remember to this very day. Same goes for Din Lux, Kinfire's only large urban settlement. The entirety of the world has been subsumed by a supernatural darkness called the Starless Night. It transforms everything it touches into gunky bad things. Thus, the residents of Dinlux, which is magically protected by Kinfire, have all declared, I ain't touching that. Which is where you come in. You have Kinfire lanterns making you members of a guild of mercenaries with permanent danger jobs. You go and touch the bad gunk and also fight it. This setting is ripe for creativity and you can see hints of it all over the place. My first experience of Dinlux was lavishly set up by two amazing components that I won't spoil here, and this is not Dinlux by the way, but they were a really nice touch. I got a sense of a place with inequality, complex politics, culture. I got a sense that maybe an isolationist policy isn't all it's cracked up to be, and I waited with bated breath for the game to really dive into that, and I would be lying if I said that it didn't. But again, it was minimal. More and more, I got a sense of talented people with cool ideas building something unique and special. Like, a lavish stage was set for a night of the most fantabulous theater with a stellar cast, and then you watch it, and it's competent, but by the numbers until a wire snaps and the lighting ring drops by the actor's feet. Just in the last video, we did give Kinfire the Game of the Year award for best campaign game, and you know what? It is. The combat portion is so fresh, so innovative, and so inviting, I can personally overlook all of the issues. And if it wasn't for them, this would be the Game of the Year. But that's because I already own it. But if I had to buy it all over again, it's not a no but I'd have to really think about it. And it doesn't help that some of the production issues are really frustrating. You might have noticed these scenario boxes. That's because everything you need to play a scenario is in them, including cards sorted into a particular order, punch boards with necessary tokens, and even dials you need to assemble for the baddies. Two thirds of those card packs didn't hold the cards in properly, so when we opened them, they were already all over the place, which is annoying because you're not supposed to look at the front of them before instructed. The dials are so loose, they are borderline unusable. It's frustrating to punch out coin and fate and kinfire tokens for every scenario. I would have been much happier doing it once rather than 21 times. And the rule book, I get what they were trying to do. The rule book is split into four parts. One found in the welcome box, the other three doled out piecemeal in scenarios one, two, and three. This is because you're meant to learn as you play, which is really cool if you like to read rules as a group activity and much less so if you want to facilitate a night of cool games and teach this svelte rule set yourself like a good host would. The layout is also tailored to that learn-as-you-play experience, but there's no rules reference to look things up afterwards, which you will need to do a lot because, once again, these were written for learning in the shortest amount of time possible. A lot of rules interactions are just 
not made evident and you'll need to BGG it and FAQ it all the time. I feel like Kinfire was rushed and I get it. It's a first time design for a new studio, but just looking at the Our Team roster on their website, the CEO was an executive producer on Netflix's Arcane. They had Felicia Day as an advisor. The designer has more experience than most in this genre. The artists are clearly fantastic. And also they have a bunch of execs and venture capitalists thrown in for good measure too. This isn't a team that lacks in experience. So when I say it was rushed, what I mean is, is that it's never been clear to me that a bunch of talented people were growing something really cool and they almost got there, but they had a tall order. They were trying to change how a board game is made, how we perceive what a board game is. This needed just a bit more feedback, a bit more time, a bit more development, and a bit more story nuance. The one thing Kinfire doesn't lack is ambition. It's just that ambition's price tag is $150. This is really the hard part because I ever so enjoyed playing this game and I don't want to minimize anyone's stellar contribution, but how do I recommend it at this price? I know I've recommended more expensive games in the past, but this dial ends up being the perfect analogy for the entire experience. This side is rock solid. And this side just comes loose. Over on the website Spacebiff, Dan Thoreau wrote an article about board game critique and mentioning price. His argument is that you shouldn't because board games are an art medium, so why sully them with money? I sort of get where Dan is coming from, whose writing is exceptional, by the way. He is one of the best of us. And also, I'm oversimplifying his point. The link to the article is in the description. Go read it. But here, I could agree if Board game prices made it an affordable form of art to appreciate to a broad category of people. But as visions become more ambitious, what once were elaborate shoeboxes full of toys have morphed into a grand clockwork spectacle that are ever so pricey to manufacture and ship. More and more, the standard price of board game has become $150, and that's after Simon has pushed it to $100 a decade ago, and that's just not affordable to most people. I'd unreservedly recommend this game if more time was spent on thinking how people would interact with the learning elements or how its world or characters were developed. I'd say it's a ridiculous price, but this thing's one in a million. Enjoy it with your friends, it's gonna be really fun. Now I can promise you about three quarters of that. Whether that's enough for you, you decide that on your own.